and remain standing for a moment of silence for Esther Hulser, who was a, a retired teacher of this district. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Four point zero one public comments on agenda items. The public comment period is a time slot set aside on the agenda for citizens to address the Board of Education. The open meetings law does not require that citizens be allowed to participate and speak at Board of Education meetings other than public hearings. The law specifies that the public has a right to attend board meetings except for executive sessions. The procedure for public comment is outlined in Board Policy 1230, Citizen Participation. A total of 30 minutes is set aside for public comment at the beginning and end of the meeting. The maximum time allowed for any one speaker is three minutes. Public comments at the beginning of the meeting are limited to items on the agenda. Persons who wish to participate in the public comment portion of the meeting must state their name and the specific topic about which they wish to speak. As speakers must limit comments to issues appropriate for public discussion, compliments or complaints about student discipline, specific student issues, or personnel should not be addressed during public comment. Speakers who wish to discuss specific student or personnel matters are encouraged to speak to the superintendent or other appropriate administrator after the conclusion of the board meeting. Interruption of board discussion is not permitted. In the interest of civility and respect for different points of view, outbursts from the audience, applause, or other types of disturbances or disruptions are not permitted. Under no circumstances will booing be tolerated. The Board of Education recognizes its responsibility to hear and respond to public comments. As stated in Board Policy 1230, the Board is not able to answer questions at the meetings, but welcomes your statements. Any questions from the public should be submitted through the use of the public comment form, which may be obtained online or at the desk with the district clerk. Responses will be provided within two business days on the district's public comment responses page so that everyone may receive the information. Is there anyone who wishes to speak at this time? Good evening, my name is Karen Clare. Thank you for allowing me to speak tonight about agenda item 7.04, approval of CSEs. I understand that I may not talk about my specific student or any specific administrators. However, I wish to bring to your attention the difficulties that parents are facing when they transition their special education student to the middle school. Wappinger Central School District uses a full day co-teach model in both the elementary and high school communities. Why then does our middle school not offer that vital support? This in inconsistency is affecting numerous 7th and 8th graders across the district. Special education services are meant to level the playing field. This specially designed instruction given by a certified special education teacher meets the unique needs of a child with a disability, allowing for a student to participate in Common Core level material. The Wappingers administration did believe in the middle school co-teach model in the past. Any educational professional will tell you that a patchwork of resource rooms, teacher assistants, and special classes can't compensate for the knowledge and continuality of having a specially trained teacher working hand-in-hand -hand with a subject teacher. The issue arose when the Board of Education needed to make budget cuts and decided that they would eliminate the program. What the Board of Education might not have realized was that by doing so, they were in violation of the federal mandate that requires districts to provide students with an individualized approach.
appropriate education in the least restrictive environment. This action also may be jeopardizing federal funds that are specifically earmarked for special education services. When a student CSE team meets and is forced to place a child in the only alternative that is offered, rather than choosing the option that is really need, needed, both the law and the trust between the parent and school is breached. If you are in doubt of the fact that this inclusion model works, just look at your northern neighbor, the District of Arlington. They have the co-teaching model in all subjects in both of their middle schools and view it as a necessity for many said students. IDEA says that children who receive special education should learn in the least restrictive environment. This means they should spend as much time as possible with peers who do not receive special education. I will end with two statements that the New York State Education Department has offered to parents. One, your child should be with students in general education, and I quote, to the maximum extent that is appropriate. And two, special classes, separate schools, or removal from the general education class should only happen when your child's learning or attention issue her disability under IDEA is so severe that supplemental aids and services can't be provided her with an appropriate education. I respectfully request that you reinstate the inclusion program at Bandwick Junior High School for the 2019-20 school year. Please consider aligning the schools in our district and righting the wrong done to many WCSD special education students. Thank you. Four point zero two communications and announcements received by the Board of Education. Ms. Goodman. I have nothing. Mr. Slowshower. Thank you. That's not his work. Thank you, Madam President. Just to be brief, uh, this past week we had our um, presentation on vaping at RCK on Wednesday. I would just like to once again thank uh, from HealthQuest, Dr. Christina Mazzoni and Dr. Dorothy Page for putting on uh, a very informative presentation. Um, we did get a decent turnout with parents and we actually had, um, I totally forgot which uh, team from John Jay students were actually attended. Yeah, I forgot which team. Do you remember which? I apologize. I forgot which team uh, appeared. Volleyball. Was it the volleyball girls volleyball? Okay, so we had some students that attended, uh, as well as parents, and look forward to the continued uh, conversation and presentations for district staff, as well as our uh, assemblies for our secondary schools. So again, just wanted to thank HealthQuest uh, for the presentation. It was extremely informative and. Uh, we look forward to sharing that information uh, with everyone else in the district. Thank you. Mr. Lumia. I concur with Mr. Schauer regarding the vaping was within Sexwood. Uh, at this point, I'd like to recognize two nurses at Ben White Junior High School, as it was done this afternoon, Mary Miranda and Dawn Dracogenetti. <laughs> with a professionalism which was used to save the life of a parent of a student at Ben White Junior High School. They had to professionally think how they were around to help that particular parent. Otherwise, we have one less parent in the district. So I'd like to congratulate both of those two teacher, two nurses for doing their job and did it professionally. I also recommend that, uh, uh, that parents who are students in IP to, to attend the CPAC meeting that are normally had during the year. The, uh, the meeting was very informative and uh, there's a lot of information that I found that was really, really, really very interesting. Mr. Galletta. Mr. Spencer. Good evening. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I also attended the Dangerous Vaping Forum at RCK. It was very informative, um, as well as the CPAC Forum on Thursday, last Thursday, um, where they discussed individualized education plans. And um, I learned a lot from the uh, forum as well. And today I was at uh, Van Wyke um, with Dr. Shukat. 
and I was so proud of the nurses, Mary and Dawn, um, for, for the actions that they took to save that life. It, it made me proud of, of being a, a part of the community. So thanks to them again. Here's Rappaport. Good evening, everyone. Um, I spent a happy afternoon on Friday watching a cold read of three one-act plays um, written by three of Mr. Casey's Writers' Workshop students, um, Allison Shaw, Evan gordon and Brielle Miano. Um, and they were performed by Ms. Cook's Brave Theater students who basically just picked up the scripts and read them impromptu. Um, as much as I enjoyed the bold inventiveness and humor of the young writers forays into urban fantasy and fractured religious history. Um, it was the warmth and supportive community among the students and their teachers that really moved me and made me feel proud of this next generation of creatives. Well done and bravos all around. I also attended the excellent vaping presentation at Ketchum, the uh, informative uh, presentation uh, at CPAC at Wapishers Junior High, uh, the drama the selections by Mr. Casey's students at, at uh, John Jay, and the uh, presentation of plaques to the uh, li heroic life-saving nurses at Van Wyck. Uh, it's a very, something that we should all remember that um, many of the positions that we have in the district, now that we're talking about the budget, many of our support people, such as the nurses, are essential parts of our, te our educational team, and we are very grateful that they were there and knew exactly what to do. Uh, the, uh, I also was at the Long-Term Development Committee meeting, and of course with Mr. Lumi at the agenda setting meeting. 5.01, superintendent's report. Good evening, Board of Education. Um, respectfully, I'd like to go 5.01, 5.026.01 as a full presentation, and then we can have the questions as we do with our roadshow. So we make sure that it just kind of flows together. First, I'd like to, all of our seniors out in the back, um, how you doing? Looking forward to graduation, to all these wonderful, exciting things that awaits. We can't wait to see you on stage receiving your diploma. Keep up the good work and um, do the right thing. <laughs> uh, moving forward with um, the superintendent's recommended budget, What, um, one of the things the board is very supportive is always talking about language and ensuring that we're, um, we're very comprehensive in the way we speak. And for many people, for many people in the community, when you talk about a school district budget, it's almost like a second language. So as you can see here, this is a page that we've held down to for the past four to five years where we um, bold the necessary words for people to understand what a budget is made of. And obviously the budget is the district spending. Um, we have the tax levy, the tax levy increase, state aid, other revenue, and assigned fund balance. Um, as we move along, we, when we look at our budget and we find out how are we going to balance this budget, we really think about alignment of programs, evidence, data, recommendations, and or mandated, mandated, some of these mandated requirements that we're not too thrilled about, but we are forced to um, put into place to build a budget. So we think about our mission and core values, our Board of Education's values and goals, administrative goals, our navigating our way document, which is aligned to the BO Board of Education values, and. The Superintendent's Forum, a budget conversation, always willing to hear from the public and taking recommendations from our community. The above mentioned guides decisions to primarily in student instructional programs and opportunities, 
building level administrative teaching and support staff decision making, extracurricular, student achievement. For example, graduation rates. Oops. Um, the, the constraints and challenges and considerations that we face, um, usually we have done this in the past as a narrative. This time we decided we would take it and create it into a table so that not everything comes across as seeming as a constraint or, or a, a, a being negative. So for example, when you think of um, um, our, our Board of Education, um, their considerations, they're not constraints, they're not challenges, they're considerations that they, pro they, they, they want the administration to really take a look at to see how we can continue to enhance um, programs for our students instructionally and after school um, as an example of that. But we take the categories and, and not every category falls under a positive light as you can see state aid, tax cap, unfunded mandates, stability of economic markets, commitment to sustain and continue opportunities and options more than the minimum requirement for students. That's one of the things about Wappinger's Central School District. We really, really, really want to create as much opportunities for students um, in school and after school. Our Board of Education, administrative budget proposals, um, as I said, the WCSD learning community, uh, budget conversations, superintendent forums, and use of estimates, no definitive numbers. And this is one of the more difficult pieces as we begin to balance a budget. I'd also like to share with the Board of Education that um, we've had three snow days, three official snow days. We haven't had any that has negatively impacted the Board of Education meetings. And we are really running in a nice, timely schedule with the first draft of the superintendent's budget, um, recommended budget. As you know, we have a process that we've put into place. How do we balance the proposed budget without piercing the tax cap? Um, our goal has always been to not have to come to the um, Board of Education and request um, piercing the tax cap, going over um, the tax cap. And what we have realized is that there are things, some of the constraints and some of the things that are just part of a budget that are non-negotiable. Salaries are non-negotiable. And um, so what we realize is that when we're trying to balance a budget, we're looking seven, almost 78% of that budget is non-negotiable. Money you can't touch, money you can't play with. I.e., for um, example, salaries. Um, slightly negotiable is where we look at and we highlight that in yellow where we think about items that we're really saying we really if we have to shave we will shave and we will make it work but it doesn't give us a cushion it doesn't give us um, the opportunity to to feel very comfortable when we touch into the slightly negotiable area which is almost 20 percent of that budget 18.7 percent and what's negotiable which, you know, these are words that we have to use some type of words so that we could all understand each other, but um, what's negotiable, what we can really consider and look at where we are not violating um, any requirements or mandates or violating any collective bargaining unit agreements is um, the green, which is only 3.4% of the budget. So when you look at that number, you're looking at $7,624,897. For this year, the proposed budget is $234,608,137. As we move forward, the proposed budget remains, as I said before, within the tax cap. Um, the tax levy for the 2018, we always like to provide you with the previous year, the tax levy was slightly above $165 million, and the proposed tax levy for this school year is $169,171,293. So levy to levy, the difference or the increase that you see is $3,543,424. Um, As a percentage, we're looking at a levy increase of 21.4%. 2.14%. As far as the entire budget is concerned, as far as the entire budget is concerned, 
we're looking at an increase of three million two hundred ninety five thousand five hundred six dollars uh, in percentage we're talking a one point four two percent um, and that is the proposed budget that big number you see on top of this um, presentation um, it is our our culture and climate should always provide the evidence and to stick with the numbers and show the Board of Education what has continued to occur historically. Um, state aid correlation, this is based on the data figure increases and percentage rates fluctuate. We've had this conversation and our assistant superintendent, um, Kristen Crandall, did a very nice job to talk about the inconsistencies and why we don't always see a trend of how our state aid increases or decreases year to year. Our proposed number for the 2019-2020 school year, we're looking at 24.6%, which is slightly lower, almost a half percent from um, last year. Um, but every penny counts, and I continue to be optimistic, and I'm not giving up to see, I know, I know, but I have to. I have to continue to be optimistic to look at um, what potentially we may receive from the state education department. Can we just add one thing? Yes, please. Sure. So when you're looking at the 17 or 18, 19, and 19, 20 numbers, please be mindful that all the numbers below the projected, everything below 19, 20 is what we actually received in aid. So if, if you look at the runs that we received from the governor, it does not indicate that we received more, we're receiving less money this year. That, I'm sorry, let me rephrase. It does not show that we're receiving less money projected for 1920 because, again, they're just comparing governor run to enacted budget. So it's a little bit of apples and oranges there, but it is actual state aid received. So we just wanted to make sure we shared that. And that's why that, that bar graph, I mean, that one row on the top um, is bold and blue. So um, this is a multi-year analysis uh, showing where we, my first presentation, I believe, or second um, uh, uh, as superintendent, 2016-17, um, um, the first draft of the presentation when it was held, um, as you can see, we're a little um, ahead of schedule um, with March 4th today being the presentation. Um, what you see the taxpayer, what they have approved in terms of budgets um, from 221 million plus in 2016-17 for the 2016-17 school year. Um, last year, we, this year, the money we're working with right now is 231 million, 312,000, And then we show in dollars the increase from year to year, as well as the, um, the percentage in terms of approved budget change by percentage. Moving forward, once again, we. Can I go back one more second? I just want to show something. Again, if you look at the increases from 16, 17, 17, 18, 18, 19, those were all a result of increased state aid that came in after the superintendent's original presentation was done. So it's important to note that. At the time the superintendent's presentations were done, we were at the cap number with all of the information that we had received to date. And I'm, I'm glad you brought that up also because, um, as you know, this is the first draft and, we, and, and based on some of recommendations from Board of Education members, we provided you with a much more detailed explanation and the questions that you provided, the questions that you asked, um, we were able to answer them and they will be posted on our website. With that said, there's still work to be done because um, as Kristen just mentioned, what your, your first draft, and as we continue to look at some of the questions posed by the Board of Education, as we continue to see maybe additional state aid that may come in, um, we then make other determinations. And there are some other items that we still need to look at and we will share with the board on Friday. Um, once again, budget to budget and levy to levy, we'd like to show the Board of Education and the community um, the increases from year to year um, and what we're looking at for this school year. That's just another way. Um, we're pretty much, um, we differentiate. <laughs> this is a differentiated presentation. We provide you with the same information in various ways. 
so that everyone has an opportunity to look at it and make sense of it the best they can. Again, a recommended budget is broken down into eight categories, and we've talked about that. So the expense breakdown, um, the way we spend the money, the 234, the 231 million plus for the 1819 school year, and now what's being recommended so far as the first draft, $234 million plus, it's broken down into salaries, textbooks, benefits, OCs, contractual supplies, equipment, debt services, and transfers. And when you saw that traffic light where it shows that almost 80% of our budget can't be touched, some of those items fall under those categories. For example, salaries and benefits, um, among a couple others. So the revenue breakdown. Okay, how do we come up with $234,608,137? Well, this is how we come up with it. We're hoping that we get more than 24.6% from the state, but um, some of us are not as op optimistic about that, but um, we're hoping that that number could be slightly higher. Then our tax levy, our tax base, um, that's where we get the bulk of our money. The bulk of our money is 70.63% based on our taxpayers. Um, <coughs> other revenue is 1.03%, and tax levy increase is 2.14%. That's also added into the revenue breakdown. That's how we came up with this. Um, based on this, the percentage breakdown, this is the superintendent's recommended budget. I think it's also important for those of you who went to the advocacy breakfast, um, I believe as superintendent, Joe Phelan did a very good job of really explaining the inconsistencies with state aid proposals and what it means to one school over another school. So it's very critical, that number and the number that we would receive from the state education department, any extra dollar would really be beneficial for our students here in Wappingers. Lastly, the superintendent's recommended budget, as you know, um, now this is in a, a narrative. This is the proposed budget right now. It's subject to change, let's keep that in mind. Um, the adoption date of the budget by the Board of Education will be April 23rd, 2019. The great thing about this Board of Education and this administration is our continued collaboration and communication. Um, so we will continue to have that communication. You ask away and we will be sure to provide you with the explanations. Levy to levy, proposed allowable tax cap is within regulation. WCSD has never had to pierce the tax cap. And when you pierce the tax cap, you have to get the supermajority vote in order for it to pass. And budget to budget, proposed allowable tax cap is within regulation. Taxpayer approved budget comparison from the 2018-19 to 2019-20 school years by percentage increase. Once again, we are an open book. We, um, and we welcome and we embrace our community to ask questions, to send us emails, and within 48 hours we are posting those questions. Um, and we will be posting your questions respectfully after this meeting today. As we move forward with our um, bus proposition um, this year, and I'll let, I'll let um, Kristen, um, take the bus proposition. Good evening, so we would just like to take a few moments this evening to have a conversation about the proposed bus proposition for the 1920 school year. Uh, this is a conversation we have annually. It is um, financed through a five-year revolving ban process. So as we start the conversation, none of that has changed. That all will remain the same. However, we do have a few factors this year that have changed um, and made us, uh, caused us to reevaluate where we stand with regard to our fleet. So this, this slide is just a basic information slide. It indicates what our current fleet looks like on the left-hand side. It also shares the number of miles driven between 18 and 19, and we did have a 3.9% decrease um, in miles driven uh, between the two years. And also, on the right-hand side, it share, the, the graph shares the years 
of the vehicles we're looking to replace. So we're looking to replace 25 vehicles and they range in years from 2005 to 2007. The bus proposition for the 2019-20 school year is $2,297,040. That is our request. And the reason why and how we came to that decision was using the data that supports the age, the safety, and safety of our fleet, as well as being fiscally diligent, the current enrollment of the district, as well as aligning student needs with federal mandates and requirements. So if you can t just take a quick look and see, you'll see what type of vehicles and the, um, that we are asking to replace, and we'll have more conversation along this line as we move through the, pro uh, through the slides. Yes. There's been some requests for additional sports runs. Is, would that affect the bus? No, this transportation is the request? Proposition. The bus proposition would not be okay. affected by sports runs because we, we do need to already. purchase new vehicles for that purpose. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So the bus proposition has, uh, from year to year, we attempt to keep, keep it level at the same dollar value or pretty darn close because what that allows us to do is have no fluctuation in our budget line in the general fund because that is, that is where the principal and interest payments are made on those revolving year. Um, bond anticipation notes. But one thing that we as an administration we're looking to try to do, we're, get the, we're to get the 700 series, which is um, 2002 through 2007, or 2002 model years off the books. Meaning that we have vehicles that are in the 700 series that have been on the road since 2002. So we've been looking to try to find a way to slowly get those vehicles out of the fleet because they are older. They have high, higher mileage, as you can see, approximately 145,000 miles. And, and really that means higher costs with regard to keeping them compliant, as well as labor costs in order to achieve that goal. So we have all but two vehicles uh, being able, from that 700 series, being able to be uh, removed from the fleet through the 1920 school year if this proposition were to pass and also be approved by the Board of Education, but were also to be passed by the, by the community. So this is an example of long-term planning, how we could possibly try to meet that goal and yet we still fell a little short. However, the reason why that occurred is will be seen in the next slides. I went the wrong way, like I do every time. So we do have an aging fleet. That's again why that 700 series uh, reduction was so important to us. So this slide shows you the number of vehicles by year. And also on the right hand side, just another way of seeing that same information and also seeing the average mileage for the number of vehicles by each year. We continue to state about safety um, and the age of our fleet. Uh, safety is our top priority, so therefore we need to make sure that we meet all the minimum qualifications at the very least with regard to these vehicles. And again, going back to the revolving bo uh, bond anticipation notes, keeping that budgetary line as even as possible from year to year doesn't allow for any seesaw effect when we're trying to balance budget. What we have found over the last few years is that we've needed to have more students ride smaller vehicles. And that is for several reasons. And we indicate this on the right hand side of this screen. We have IEPs, we have home, lo home location of students that um, we can't get up on the mountain with those big vehicles. So we need to use smaller vehicles. Uh, we have out of feeder daycare and um, school requests and also federal mandates that have really put a stress on our smaller fleet vehicles. So as you can see, our enrollment may be continuing to decline from year to, to year to year. However, the students needing to ride on vans is actually increasing. So the, the um, proposition this year actually reflects that addressing that need. We are requesting two additional vehicles wheelchair vehicles which actually can accommodate 39 passengers the other vehicles that we the small vehicles we have ha can house 19 
so if we could have those wheelchair vehicles added to our fleet it would allow us to go to either bring more students in one vehicle to an out of district school for example or if we have our van that needs to handle out of theater daycares we could put more students on that vehicle so it does give us the increased flexibility that we need we also would be looking to reduce the number of large vehicles by two our fleet would stay exactly the same at 261 vehicles but we would just change the makeup of the fleet in order to meet the needs that we have specifically with regard to enrollment so here is two different pictures a picture and a chart of our bus propositions the makeup of that proposition either by vehicle and by year or by dollar amount by year and the change in the percentage as I indicated the way that we pay for these vehicles is through a five-year bond anticipation note and right now Wappinger Central School District enjoys a transportation reimbursement rate of 57.1 percent so the annual cost of the five-year um, bond anticipation note would be four hundred fifty nine thousand four hundred eight dollars the state aid would be reduced leaving a net annual cost of approximately one hundred ninety seven thousand eighty six dollars and those vehicles you may ask that we um, look to to reduce our fleet or I'm sorry replace in our fleet 25 vehicles we bring them to auction and get anywhere from two hundred dollars to two thousand dollars or five thousand dollars on those items and we do share that information with the board as it becomes uh, available to us we have auctions twice a year uh, we have the budget comp or the budget website up and going everything is posted on the website we continue to try to um, get the best information that we can to be able to provide the, the Board of Education with the most solid information when they need to make their decisions. Thank you very much. Questions from the board? Mr. Slowshower. Mr. Randall, just for clarity, um, <clears throat> there is no mandate from New York State as to how many uh, wheelchair vehicles a district must, must have. Is, that's dictated by obviously the need based on, on students, correct? Absolutely, there is no, and for example, if the district did not have any wheelchair vehicles and we needed and we needed to transport a child, we would have to contract out for that service because we do have to offer transportation. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Yes, oh, yes, budget and transportation. Oh. Yes. Uh, Mr. Spencer. Uh, thank you, Superintendent Cario for the presentation. How close are we to the tax cap? At it. We're at it. At it, I think. We're at it. Thank you. Yes, I believe uh, uh, Mrs. Crandall has explained to us in the past that if we don't go up to the tax cap any year, we get punished the next year because it reduces the amount we could spend in the future. So when we do, uh, which is not true this year, but when we do have a little bit of extra money to get up to the uh, tax cap, uh, what uh, Mr. Ho Mr. Carrion and Mrs. Crandall do is they find uh, things that we could buy that year that we would need. You know, in other words, they push forward, um, uh, you know, equipment or, or, or supplies that we would need to make it most advantageous so that when the next year we don't have so much, mo so much money, uh, we already have what we need. Is that correct? Do I, do, did I explain yeah, it less, we, adequately? Yes, yes. Um, we definitely make sure um, all of our administrators, and um, including the Board of Education, have made some great recommendations in the past years um, from, from science initiatives to looking at equipment. Um, and so we received some very thorough proposals and that wish list never gets completed. So overall, we, we then prioritize and look at student need and student enrichment and enhancement to ensure that we take it all the way up to the 
allowable tax cap. And we went to Dutchess County School Boards Association um, one year where there was a terrific presenter who really encouraged all school districts that they should really be taking their budgets up to the tax cap because it may feel good one year, but then you'll hurt the next year because you don't get that money back. That's it, yes. <laughs> Mr. Galetta. I just wanted to ask about the proposed um, modified cross team that's proposed in the it's budget. Uh, the team itself is looking about 10,500. There's a trend. Excuse teams. me? Two, two teams. teams. I'm sorry, two teams. Um, there's a associated transportation cost with that yes. is an additional 90,000 plus is yes. that and that's just no. it's, it's is that for those two teams as well or is that no, not go ahead specific not 90,000 just for those okay. two teams it's included into that $90,000 budget so it's added in there it's built in there Oh, that's I think I understand what you're asking. I'm sorry. Are you asking that these teams would benefit from the use of that those additional vehicles? Because we already have a stress transportation system for our interscholastics, and for the last several years, quite they have a request has been made by interscholastics to have additional late buses added to the to the to the to the pool. Yeah, um, and that has not been included. If since these two teams are included in this budget, there is absolutely no way that we could run at the interscholastics without adding those vehicles. So will it ease a stress on the system for all teams? Absolutely, but we just wouldn't be able to handle 14 more traveling games um, without the addition of, uh, without easing the, uh, the stress on that system. Uh, Mr. Spencer. So then I guess the answer is uh, that the, the modified lacrosse, adding the modified lacrosse teams would cost $100,000 and not just I, I would not, I don't think that's a fair statement per se, only because it would, that added vehicle would be benefiting all of Wappinger Central School District Interscholastics, not just the modified teams. If we were to add them, it needs to be included. If we were not to add them, the system would still benefit. They're not exclusive. The systems would still benefit from having it. Right, right. But right. if we didn't have to expand the runs, we wouldn't have to. We wouldn't it. have to, but right. it would definitely assist and, and answer requests that's been for several years being asked. So it's almost like killing two birds with one stone because the, the there has been a request to expand the runs, and we're going to expand the runs. And as a matter of fact, the modified lacrosse team would be able to take advantage of that expand of runs in the afternoon. But let's just say there was no proposal for the modified lacrosse, we would still be considering that because that has been a continuous request um, on an annual basis to expand the runs for after school activity and programs. Uh, okay. So the only cost well, I had to be $10,000. I meant to say interscholastic. So basically for lacrosse, the actual cost, we have profit tank grant, correct? No, I mean, you still have to include some indirect costs through the expanded run. I understand that, but it's not going to be $100,000. It's going to be, correct? That's correct. If we, if we can try to give you a breakdown if you would like that. I, w okay. I would. Okay. That would be helpful. Yeah, yeah sure. Okay. Uh, Mrs. Goodman. I do appreciate that clarification on the bus runs very much. I'd also actually, in that breakdown, would like to find out exactly how many of our students will use this expanded bus run. Because we're looking at adding $100,000 worth of busing while for sports, while we are contracting art, music, academics, and I'm sorry, as a former klutz and current klutz, and a teacher, I'm not sure I'm completely on board with it yet. I need more information. Thank you. Any other questions on either the budget or transportation proposition? Okay. Thank you. And we Thank will you. provide explanations to the, your, your request. Thank you.
6.02, approval of transportation proposition. Resolved the Board of Education of the Robert Center School District authorizes submission of the following proposition for the qualified voters of the district to vote on the annual district meeting budget vote and election to be held on May 21st, 2019. Shall the Board of Education of the Robert Center School District put them in Dutchess County, New York District be authorized to purchase student transportation vehicles at a maximum estimated sum of two million two hundred ninety-seven thousand forty dollars, and set amount of so much thereof as may be necessary shall be raised by a levy of a tax upon the taxable property of the district and collected in annual installments as provided by law, and for which obligations of the district may be issued. Do we have a motion, Mrs. Goodman? Second, Mr. Galletta. Any further discussion? All those in favor? <coughs> Unanimous. 7.01, consent agenda resolution. Is there anyone who wishes to remove something from the consent agenda? Okay. Resolved, the Board of Education does hereby approve the following consent agenda as amended. Items as stated 7.02, 7.03. 7 7.04, 7.05, 7.06, 7.07, 7.08, 7.09, and 7.10. Uh, excuse me, yes, you have a question. Mrs. Pedro. Should it be 7.03 and addendum? 7.03, as amended. Okay. As an addendum. Okay. Do we have a motion for the consent agenda? Mrs. Goodman, second? Unanimous. Eight point zero one. Approval of bid award security vestibules. Resolved that the, that the reader supports that. Excuse me, I'm sorry, which one? Okay. 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 Eight Whereas the Board of Education of the Wabash Center School District advertised for a bid for the 2016 district uh, wide renovation security vestibules project, and whereas the bids of the project was advertised on January 14, 2019, and February 15, 2019, received in public open, and read aloud on February 5, 2019, and February 26, 2019, respectively, in accordance with Section 103 of the Gen General Municipal Law. And whereas the district architect, Runback Architect and Planning PC, based on their investigation of the bids and bidders, recommends that the board award the contract to the lowest possible bidders, responsible bidders. Now, therefore, be resolved the Board of Education of the Center School District take the following action. Based on the recommendation of its architect, the board hereby awards the contracts for the projects as follows Contract GW1, General Contractor, Interior Vestibules, Contract of Barron Construction, Highland, New York. Base bid amount of 515,000 to award 515,000. Contract GW2 General Work Exterior Vestibules. Contract to PBC con PBS Construction, Opal Junction, New York. Base bid amount 698,435. Alternate one amount 19,650. Alternate three amount 165,000. Alternate four amount 162,000. Total award one million forty-five thousand eight hundred eighty-five dollars. Contract E1 uh, Security Vestibules Electrical Work. Contract to RLJ Electric Corporation, Pisco, New York. Base bid amount one hundred sixty-two thousand. Total award one hundred sixty-two thousand. We further resolve that the aforementioned contract board is subject to the execution of a written contract and supply of all insurance certificates and performance and labor material payment bonds in the form in accordance with the service condition prescribed. In the project manual, originally dated March 31st, 2017, after a review and recommendation by the district attorney and his board of consultants. Do we have a motion? Mr. Slowshower, second. Mr. Galletta, any discussion or question? Mr. Lumia. I just want to have uh, Mr. Lakeem explain to us uh, why the, we're paying last year 500,000 addition as to oppose when this was first proposed. So just a quick explanation for the benefit of the community as well as the board. Okay, thank you. Uh, so the, the it's two pieces. One would be the uh, cost of materials has gone up in the two years since the project was first envisioned. Um, you know, for the cost of steel, cost of aluminum. Uh, but most, the larger piece of the cost increase comes from 
uh, the availability of work and, uh, and supply of contractors able to do the job. It's my understanding that there are a number, many, 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 many projects being bid uh, for school districts in the area uh, and contractors are enjoying all of the work and are able to um, uh, are able to uh, charge choose. higher prices, pick and choose their projects, and, and charge higher prices for their work because there's so much of it. Thank you. Uh, the Legislative Action Committee drafted a letter which was approved by the board to our legislators and the governor on the subject of uh, the delays that we encountered at the state level in getting approval uh, for the, this project. Uh, I believe it was uh, over 18 months uh, in total. And therefore, in this time, we wound up having to spend another $500,000. Uh, and Ms. Pe Mrs. Pedro was awaiting these final numbers to send the letter. And Mrs. Pedro, you will have or will be sending it. Thank you very much. I think it's also important to note that there's still money left in the, uh, in the, in that correct? Yes, so what we did was we we're, we we're going to offset the previous yet to be approved project by uh, the state. We we're going to offset a, a couple hundred thousand dollars off of that um, to sort of absorb the cost. And overall, there'll still be just a, a bit over $900,000 left in Smart Schools Bond Act money to be used at a future time. Um, and this, this approval uh, for the increased funding, you know, to use of these funds for Smart Schools as well as the offset cost concept was approved by the Smart Schools Bond Act Committee last week. Very good. Okay. Any other comments? Mr. Slowshower. Just with that being said, Mr. Lokima, obviously a member of that committee, I want to thank all the members of that committee. Correct me if I'm wrong, that was a unanimous decision. <coughs> right, that was a unanimous decision to offset some of the money. Um, so I just want to thank everybody on the committee for doing that, obviously. Uh, probably about a 90 minute or so conversation. Um, a lot of ideas were exchanged, good points, different things, different perspectives were brought up, but, but in the end, the safety of our students, our teachers, all of our district employees, um, you know, obviously made the most sense, but at the same time, still focusing on what the uh, other aspects of the, of the bond were for, which was for upgrading our, um, you know, computer, our internet, and uh, things of that nature. So again, just want to thank all the members of the committee coming together for that compromise. And, and I'd also like to thank Mr. Bras as well as John Sharkey from Rhinebeck Architecture for coming and giving a presentation to the committee so that way the committee understood exactly where the money was going. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. All those in favor? Unanimous. 8.02, second reading of policies. Resolve the Board of Education of Wabash Center School District here by approve the second reading of and adopt the following policy based upon the first reading by the board and the recommendation of the policy committee as stated. Changes are in bold and slash underlined. Do we have a motion? <coughs> Mrs. Goodman, <coughs> second. Mr. Lomia, discussion or questions? All those in favor? Unanimous. Are there any amendments to the agenda? Seeing none, 10.01, comments from the public. Any comments related to school district business are welcome at this time. Ple the previous rules apply, and please limit your time at the mic to three minutes. Hello everybody, it's Marie Johnson again. Um, I just wanted to say that I also attended the vaping and there was a lot of wonderful information and I can't wait for it to get out to the rest of the public. And also I'd like to thank all the board members that came to the CPAC meeting this past Thursday. It was informative and it just really showed that um, it, we really felt how much you guys cared about it and we really wanted to thank you. Thank you. Budget things, whether it's because of my other um, 
my daughter had to come, we always talk about money for sports. So I'm just wondering, um, what is the percentage of money that's allocated per student for sports versus music or art? Does anyone know that? Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, okay. <laughs> well, we don't answer questions okay. at this time, but if so you'll write it down okay. uh, and give it to Mrs. Pedro, it will be answered on the district website uh, within two business days. Okay. And then we'll all have the correct, exact information. Okay. Because if we answer questions uh, off right. the cuff, we you might not say right. it exactly yeah. right. And all it right. might not be accurate. And then just part two to that, I'd just be interested to see the percentage of students that get scholarships for um, related to sports versus music or art. That would be another question. Just to see if that money is being allocated fairly. Thanks for your time. Okay, thank you. Uh, good evening, all. Well, I just wanted to second Maureen's comment um, on uh, those board members that did take the time to come. Um, there was like one thing after another to do uh, last week, so it was exceptionally noticed because I think it was Monday, Tuesday, yeah, Thursday. It should have been four days, actually. Um, and there was a, a parent that got up before. I've addressed this um, with the powers that that, that be. Uh, um, I did my research. We did take it away, the inclusion. Um, it doesn't affect my present child in the junior high, but it's kind of an oxymoron. We have two years part-time inclusion, four years full inclusion, two years part-time, and then as needed. Um, I know, I know certain board members that teach things like math, which always has inclusion in their common core, but it's, it's kind of weird listening to parents project at like CPAC meetings, that they could almost guarantee that their child's gonna fail the social studies region when they're in seventh and eighth grade, because they're built, you know, they are build, still building blocks. That we will give it to them then, when like it's the year of the regions, but we have all these gaps, um, in between. So I, I obviously am sitting here enough to know that we're not going to fix that in this year's budget, but maybe in some long-term planning is something we could try to fit fit back in for, for these kids who are not set up to fail. And, and I'd love to know the correlation, which I'm not going to write it down, but just food for thought, of how many of the special ed kids end up in our summer programs and our like reboot programs that failed, that didn't have inclusion, social studies and science in seventh and eighth grade, but do have it in ninth and 10th. And this precedes any present administration. I know these things happened even before my time. Thank you. Okay. All right, do we have a moment to adjourn? Mr. Lumia, second. Ms. Rappaport, all those in favor? Unanimous.